dive into what parents need and say, what do you need to do to make education successful for your children? And so we launched Engage Detroit, and you'll hear more about that. Yeah, I think a, a little best kept secret, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but um, 25 years ago when Florida Virtual School actually was founded, the impetus for it really came from the homeschool community. And so that was back in the day when homeschooling wasn't cool. And we as educators were, you know, quite high and mighty about believing that, you know, we could always do it better. And if you were a homeschool family, you must be weird. Uh, it must be for religious purposes, um, and and it was substandard. Well, it couldn't have been further from the truth, and and so they have been a large part of the virtual community ever since. So fast forward, I'm currently uh, managing director at ASU Prep Academy, which is a network of charter schools. We have 11 brick and mortar schools, and then we have one K through 12 digital school. Um, about 7,000 kids total. But we serve students all over the world in many different ways, and we partner with schools all over the world. But what we're finding with families is that it, it actually makes me laugh, and, and it makes all of us, uh, we all laugh privately, is that people think this is new. Homeschool families have been doing this for years, and they've been doing it incredibly well in many cases. And so now what's come to the forefront is that families were forced to take over their, their, they were actually forced to get involved in their child's education and actually see what education looked like and get to know their teachers uh, and see their students' content and work in a very, very different way. And so what we've observed is there are some families that they really liked it and, and obviously I shouldn't say obviously, but obviously we did it really well because um, we were highly experienced at virtual learning. And so as parents are looking at, okay, is my only choice to be full-time virtual or full-time brick and mortar? Uh, I don't think so. And so what we're starting to see is parents um, are really looking at different ways that their, that their children uh, can experience education. So when we first got started um, back, our first schools opened in 2002, and um, one of them was in Wisconsin. Um, and there was a very, very, very active homeschool community in Wisconsin at the time, and they thought we were the work of the devil um, because we were virtual public schools, so bringing public schools into people's homes. Um, and so we were caught actually between a little bit of a rock and a hard place, right? Because the homeschool community, especially the organized homeschool community that had been necessarily advocating for their rights for decades, right, against the, you know, the, the great brick wall of organized public education on the one side, and then traditional educators on the other side who also thought we were the work of the devil. Um, so, you know, our job at that point, and really for the past couple of decades, has been to say, no, actually, this is very familiar to you, but it's just wrapped in a slightly different package. And so a big piece of our messaging has always been the things that you love about a really great public school, or in the case of our global private schools, a really great private school, um, is not just the academics, it's the relationships with your teacher, it's the relationship student to student, it's the extracurricular activities, it's the opportunities that opens up for your child. All of that is available in a, in a really good, well-designed, virtual school experience. Um, and Sometimes people believe that on the face of it. A lot of times you have to really prove it to them. And I will say that the one thing that the pandemic did was um, sort of expose this model of education to literally everybody around the globe um, that had a kid. Um, and they had the chance to compare what they were getting from their local school in terms of remote emergency remote instruction versus a design from scratch, um, you know, built for purpose virtual school. Um, and the built for purpose virtual school as an option for families actually looked pretty good to an awful lot of families. We went, we increased our enrollment in our schools by about 40%. And I'm really thrilled to say that most of those families who came in are, are sort of COVID cohort um, who came in during the pandemic have stayed um, because they've found that it really meets the needs of their students. Um, and that was not a foregone conclusion by any stretch that that would be the case. So it's that sense of not, of not really being 
fish nor fowl um, when you're a fully virtual school and helping people understand that that's okay. Um, and then in fact, there's some there there that might really meet the needs of their students. And I'll pick up on that point uh, from Mickey that the families who discover really high quality virtual learning, um, about 20% of them want to continue with it long term. So when you talk to them about what did you like about it? Why would you want to continue this? To talk about the academic personalization, the fact that the child was able to move at their own pace, uh, the fact that they could master a concept before moving on rather than being forced to move at someone else's pace. So it's really the, the, the true promise of digital learning. They were seeing it. And this is not the, the, the kids who were in Zoom school or emergency remote, right? Like that didn't work well for most kids and probably should be banned forever. But the high quality, well-designed virtual learning that these guys are talking about and these guys deliver every day, um, that actually parents love. And they're not going back to their old system. So what we do is we talk to those families and they tell us, I love the online learning. I love the self-paced. I love the flexibility of schedule. But, but... <laughs> it's not working for our life. I gotta go back to work. I can't be at home with my kid. Or I really want my kid to be around other kids during the school day. Or how are we gonna plan all these activities for them? Like, I'm not, I don't wanna be a homeschool parent necessarily. So that's where we come in. So we operate in-person learning pods that supplement alternative models. So you can be enrolled in an online school and come to our learning pod for everything else. So while the students are with us, they're doing their academic coursework as part of any online school or a homeschool program. They're building relationships with their peers and doing enrichment activities, all supported by an educator who's acting as a coach. So it really acts as a nice supplement to make everything easier for those families. It's a support system. And then it gives those kids a sense of community that sometimes they, they feel like they're not gonna have if they opt for the alternatives. And you all started to go there in, in, in your remarks, but what are you seeing on the ground in terms of macro trends right now? Like we're coming out of the pandemic a little bit. It's more of an endemic phase. There, there may be some more upward slopes, unfortunately, that occur. But I'm, I'm curious, what are the actual numbers of, of parents and students embracing these alternative school forms? What are your questions around these numbers? What don't we know still? And where do you think this is going? Mickey. Millennial parents. Say more. So I think we're in this massive generational shift um, between um, generations of parents and that millennial parents, many of whom whose children are quite young still, um, but very much headed into, into the school system, I think are extremely accustomed to having lots of choices. Um, they're accustomed to having technology allow for kind of mass customization. They're really impatient with the idea that, that there's only one choice. And you know, one choice, especially if you're not somebody that has like a fabulous income. Um, and there's a lot of millennials floating around out there and they may have put off getting married, having children, buying houses and so on, but they're doing it now. Um, and so we, what we see is this millennial parents of younger Gen Z kids and alpha generation kids, both of whom are completely oriented to having their life mediated online. I think the other thing also that we've noticed is that through COVID, the parents got accustomed to being at home. Many parents, I know there's some in here, um, may have gone to the Bahamas for the year and worked from the Bahamas for the year with their families. Um, people, when, uh, people were moving out of Arizona by the droves and when we were asking where they were going, you know, are, are, where are they going? They're not in our schools. They're leaving the state. They're going to be with family. They're going different places. Um, and so I think that happened all over the country. And back to the millennials, they got very accustomed to the freedom and the flexibility of having their kids at home and being able to roam, as I say. And so we're seeing uh, uh, parents that want that flexibility to continue without having to take their kids out of school and put them in another school. So what we're trying to do at ASU Prep Academy is create multiple models that we can then explore and, and, and kind of view the outcomes for those models that give parents the opportunity to make changes during the year if they so need to be. That's difficult. That's difficult for those of us that are operating and organizing to do that. But if you put the student at the center of your decisions, then that student need drives. And so 
we've seen a lot of kids absolutely blossom by the, um, just, just by having the opportunity to have what they need when they need it and be in sync with their parents. Um, families, I met with a family last week and um, the mother actually travels for business internationally and sometimes she's gone for three to five weeks at a time. She now takes her whole family with her and they all travel together and her husband works remotely now and he used to report to an office. And so they've changed the structure of schooling for their, stu for their children completely. So again, I, I think that schools are gonna have to wake up and focus on if I don't provide options and choices, families are just gonna continue to leave uh, our, our public and private schools. Yep. So um, in Detroit, like most uh, larger urban cities, right, you have families who can't afford to do some things, right? Like they don't have the money to pay for tutors to come in and supports. So uh, our public school uh, listed last year that they had a 60% truancy rate. Um, that is catastrophic. Um, and not just that truancy rate, but they did not know where a lot of children were at the end of the school year, right? And so the assumption was that families were just being neglectful, but the reality was in Detroit also, we had a five-time increase on homeschooling, okay? So with that five-time increase, our, my question in my head is always, how many of those children did you not count that were actually homeschooling, right? Families that are tapped out and they said, guess what, if you won't do it for us, we'll do it ourselves, right? And, and so Engage Detroit, we decided to get coaches for families. Coaches, um, a coaching process that allowed a family to come join either a large group setting or get individualized coaching. And they get to know what their children wanna do when it comes down to academics. They get to know, one, first of all, their rights. What are your legal rights around homeschooling? Protect that most definitely, right? Make sure you're on the timeline, depending on your state and all of that kind of stuff. Michigan is more fluid, but making sure that families know what their rights are, know, what, know about access to online learning platforms, or if they wanna create their own curriculum. What does that look like? What does it look like if I wanna just be a person who just totally go off the grid and travel the country and say that I am going to educate my child and I'm going to make sure they get the best education possible. How do I create curriculum? How do I make sure my child's on grade level? Um, a lot of families, it's been this kind of misconception that homeschool families don't want to know how their children are doing, right? Like we're just homeschooling and we're like, oh, we don't care. Like just, just go play in the grass, right? Like, no, it, it's, it's not that. It is actual parents who are rigorous with education and they are make sure, making sure every opportunity they get, their children are learning. Learning looks like I am putting my child in a robotics class in California on a virtual Zoom with somebody that I never actually before the pandemic probably even knew about or had access to. Learning looks like me and my child in the backyard gardening or in, a, in, our, in our kitchen doing baking products and calculating, right? What does division look like? What does multiplication look like? Like incorporating math, science, and reading, and literacy into every step of our lives. What we also know is that learning is not a typical school day. So families were really like wild when they realized like, I don't have to take my child to school from seven, like I don't have to be in front of my child from 7.30 to 3.30 badgering homeschooling into their heads to say, if you don't, like I thought my daughter, when she asked me first to homeschool, I was like, no, I don't wanna be your homeschool teacher. Like we gonna be enemies and I love you, right? Like I don't, I don't wanna be that cause I know my daughter. And so with that, I start realizing with my coach because I got coached through the process too, that I can actually give my daughter the autonomy to learn at any time. And it made it better for her. It made it less egregious. And the problem is that a lot of families were finding out that their children were feeling broken in schools. Not that the system is broken, not that not the public school entities or charter school entities are broken and their processes are broken, but that our children are broken. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Can I build on that? I love that what you said, because it's it sort of speaks to the fact that parents are standing up saying, I am the consumer, I am the decision maker, and I know what quality feels like to me, and I ask for more. And I think the effect of that you're seeing is like Boston, where you and I are from, it's the first time I think it's gone below 50,000 students in enrollment in years. LAUSD has lost 27,000 kids, they have no idea where they are. 
And that sounds like a very negative thing, and you know, for, for a lot of public school systems it is, but there's a nice silver lining in that if, if truly parents start to recognize quality and say, I demand it, it will be the rising tide that lifts all boats. Um, the superintendent of LAUSD said, I wanna win those students back. What a great message to hear from a public school leader, that I'm going to compete on quality to get those students to come back, which I don't think I've heard yet. It's always been like, this is a threat, all these alternatives are a threat, but for the first time you're hearing that they wanna do something to create new pathways and address family needs that haven't been there in the past. So I want to stay where you just went because, I mean, you referenced 16.4 percent success, uh, you know, ability to read on grade level. Uh, so what's the good, uh, you know, get, get some outcomes here, I guess, for us. H how are you thinking about the success that these parents are enjoying as they're starting to go to these alternative schooling arrangements? And how are they thinking about it? Um, in Detroit, so like, again, other cities, so our, one of the superintendents just announced that over the next 20 years, they'll be closing more schools. And so parents are literally like, you keep saying you wanna win us back, right? But then you keep showing that you, you wanna win us back to a broken system again. Like you want us to take time and take a chance on you. And parents are like, I don't have time. Like the, our children are not the future, they are right now, right? And they are being marginalized even further when they sit in classrooms that are not providing for them or not even structured in the mindset to change. I keep saying the reimagined education has been like the go-to word forever right now. Like the last about 10 minutes, everybody's reimagining education, but all they keep doing is throwing dollars at a broken system. That, that refuses to incorporate something new into a process. If we don't think about how families need education to be for these children, then it's, it's problematic, it's problematic. And so families are literally saying, I, I'd rather take the ownership into my own hands now, now that I know what to do, right? And even those families who don't know what to do, if I can figure it out, I'd rather take ownership back into my own hands and educate my own children. You know, when we um, started this work 25 years ago, we made a very firm decision that parents had to be our partners in order for us to be successful because we were not sitting right in front of those students watching what they did at every moment. And so as just a, a matter of course and a matter of business, and we actually partnered together for several years, we made the parents our partners. And it was part of the expectation, but it was also part of the beauty of the learning experience. And so I do believe, too, that um, parents got a little used to being uh, very involved, as I mentioned earlier, but they did start to partner with their schools in those scenarios where parents were having positive experiences. And what teachers started to notice um, is they had to teach kids as individuals because Zoom teaching whole group third graders or whole group second graders, uh, trying to teach them all the same thing just does not work. And so I think too, the silver lining, you know, the uh, of, of COVID in general in terms of education is it's been a, sh a, a huge wake up call. It's been a wake up call for the profession. We've had a lot of teachers leave because they've said, I don't want to do this anymore. But yet we've had a lot of teachers who have said, wow, I learned so much over the last year. I've grown so much as an educator um, and as a professional, and I want to keep growing. And how can I bring what I learned during um, the pandemic when I was working with these kids remotely into my classroom and to continue to personalize and individualize that instruction for, for those students. And so uh, I also think parents have gotten accustomed to that as well. The expectation is my child is an individual and I expect you to teach my child as an individual. So how are we gonna do it if we do it the old way? Um, we obviously haven't done that well for decades. And I would say that as What's really interesting about all of this is that, you know, if you ask any parent anywhere, what is, what is it that they want for their children? Um, I'd say they want them to be happy, and depending on where you are in the world, that either comes first or about fifth on the list, right? Um, we want them, but you really want them to be prepared to have a, a brilliant, successful, prosperous, comfortable future, right? You know, that's our, our jobs as educators, our jobs as parents. And I think the thing that's confounding to a lot of parents right now 
is that it's really hard to figure out what that actually means and what that looks like. Um, you know, in, in an era where um, saying that you must go to college <laughs> um, could mean that you're actually saddling yourself with a lifetime of debt. Um, you know, you could be training for a job that won't exist by the time you get to it. Um, and so how do you uh, empower parents and the school systems that serve them, whatever they look like, to actually build on the brilliance and the power of the individual, bring out what it is that they um, are most likely to be able to thrive with in the future, and then connect them to those opportunities. Um, and I think parents can do an awful lot of that on their own, but they do a lot more of that if they're connected together, and even a lot more of it if they're connected to a community of educators that believe that the future is not gonna be served by running kids down the assembly line like a bunch of widgets, that it really takes a different approach now. And then it starts with this idea that every student really learns differently, that every student is unique in terms of their, um, their not their, even their capabilities, but their, their passions, what excites them, what interests them, what they'll do on their own if you're not watching them, um, and finding a way to kind of harness that and allow them to build on that into their future. And I think there's a better possibility of doing that through these alternative forms of education than in a traditional school where efficiency depends on people moving at least in clumps defined by age, right, if nothing else, but really defined by a whole lot of other things that allow you to efficiently move them down the assembly line. If I can add to that, you know, one of the reasons ASU Prep Academy was actually uh, founded within ASU was because President Crow wanted to demonstrate, number one, that all kids can, but number two, that there should be a continuum of learning and that uh, students, no matter what age, learners, no matter what age, should not be bound by man-made barriers such as elementary, middle, high, college, life uh, scenarios. And so um, at ASU Prep, all of our students have the opportunity and now will be encouraged strongly to start college in high school. Uh, and we will start to prepare them for that. So without these kinds of options, you know, most people aren't going to send a 14-year-old to campus to sit in a classroom uh, with 21-plus-year-olds. Uh, but we have over 1,000 students in our schools and, um, that are actually taking college courses as high school students. And the goal is not to get a um, associate's degree, because that's an unusual with dual enrollment and AP and so forth. The goal is actually to get these kids introduced to a major so that they can see what they like, so that when they do get to college, they're in college, they have a head start, and they're not in their junior year going, oops, I don't really want to be a teacher, and I'm already in my internship. And so we have these amazing opportunities, too, that have presented themselves that, again, if we just think differently, um, families are really grappling for them. You all are teasing the next panel that I'm moderating right after yeah. this in terms of the importance of thinking about career pathways far earlier. Uh, and Mickey teased my book, uh, Choosing Sorry. College, um, which is at the bookstore, I guess, for sale. But um, but the, uh, the, the question I want to say that was like, there, there are a bunch of tailwinds against this, right? There's politicians, there are people in the media that are like, this doesn't work as well. They look at the results of online schooling historically and say, we see some bad actors, some bad outcomes. I, so w what is that gonna do, do you expect to, you know, you see a lot of energy of the parents to say no more, they want the customization and, and so forth, but how are these things going to interact on the ground? What are your forecasts of how that plays out? Well, the National Parent Union um, did a poll recently, and our poll came out, and over 60% of families said they wanted more choice, right? Like, the current choice that they have is not working. Um, during the pandemic, it did not work even worse, right? So with that, um, that's evidence that parents are saying, like, I do not want the regular systems that have been in place. And I don't think we can live in a country that limits choice because then you are making people more marginalized again, right? Like if you make children stay in broken schools in their district just because they live there, if you make it a priority for them to stay there, where do you see poverty lines ever closing, right? Um, where do you see word gaps ever closing? It's not gonna happen. And so um, the other thing is that parents have also 
seen again firsthand that it's not working. And again, everybody was doing pandemic education. Let's be clear, right? But now that we're getting back to a new normal, parents are asking, don't go back to the old normal. It didn't work then, so why stick to it now? And the, the trend across any industry over the last 100 years has been towards more choice. Right? It's, it's rare, I can't think of a single industry where people want fewer choices, people want less. Um, so if the trend is that way in healthcare, in finance, in entertainment, in media, there's no reason education shouldn't go that way. So it's gonna be just a short to medium term blip of... I was gonna say like the waiting game, basically. Yeah, like keep waiting, your head down, how long <laughs> keep your head down be, and wait it out. How long will it be until the entrenched interests finally start to realize that actually parents choosing what they want is a good thing? And now we gotta in include that within the system, include it as a way to respond to what parents need. You mentioned the media, and I can't tell you how many times, I'm sure many people in here that people have, have said, how does it make you feel when you hear these stories about how horrible online learning is and how horrible remote learning is? And, I, and, and my response is, you know, I would have thought I would have had a more visceral kind of response to that over the course of the last year and a half. But what's really interesting, again, back to the silver lining, is people are talking about it. Like, it's, it's now no longer this deep, dark secret that strange people do with their kids. It's like the whole world just experienced this, and some had a great experience, and some saw what real, really poor quality online learning looks like. And I always tell people, I call it the three cousins. There's remote learning, there's online learning, there's virtual learning. They're related, but they're very different. And so don't confuse remote learning with virtual learning, and online learning can happen anywhere. But I think... Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, the conversation is, is at least taking place. And now I think what's really important is we do need to get the media to start sharing some of the positive stories um, from some of the students that did work with um, authentic, experienced online providers um, because most of what we're seeing on the national news is let's do a spotlight on kids coming back to school. Yeah. And... I think what we know is that's not always the best case. I'll give a little, just a little uh, exclamation point. Um, we have someone in our team that met with a school last week and, and the question was, how can we be helpful? And the only answer that this particular school could give was, we need your ASU students to be our substitutes. Can you think of anything else? <laughs> no. We just need your ASU 20-year-olds to be our substitutes. And that, that leads me, to, though, to think about the fact there's a lot of people who are seeing, like, what do, how do parents know how to educate their own children? Like, what do parents know about that goes into a daily education process? Like, if you don't know, how are you educating? But parents, there are kids. They've been in our home forever. And if there's more states that are saying, you can be 18 with a high school diploma, come to get a quick credit, shadow us for a minute, and then you can educate all these 30 children in a classroom. Mind you, in Detroit, we have 30 plus children in each classroom. So if you're trusting that to people, then why not trust parents who are getting what they need, right? The resources that they need to make sure education and learning is fun for their children and impactful. The real evidence is when you see a child come to you about learning and your child for the first time is smiling about a test that they're gonna take at home, or for the first time your child is coloring in 39 different colors on their math, and they didn't get a check mark from a teacher who said, I didn't want all these colors, now you're like, you failed because you wanted to use colors, like, right? Like, education can't be punitive anymore, y'all. It cannot be punitive for our children. We have to think, think out of the box. If we are not, in a unified way, right? Homeschoolers, charter schools, online schools, public schools. If, we, it, if this is not about the children, why are we doing it? Why are we in the business of making sure that children have what they need? Because they are going to be the ones who take care of us when we are older. They are going to be the ones who are either gonna feel, you failed me. I opened a book that we got here yesterday, y'all. I don't know if y'all opened the, the when you, Right. The first comment says that his daughter told him, if in the future our climate is messed up and y'all haven't done nothing to do it, it is your fault, Dad. So here you go. Children are saying if education is not figured out, 
and in the future I feel that I have been left behind, it is your fault as the adults. We are the adults they're pointing at right now. So the one thing I will say is that makes me a little nervous, honestly. Um, you know, if, if you'd ask that question, I don't know, before the gubernatorial race in Virginia, for example, um, or some of the more recent, um, you know, kind of firestorms happening on boards of education across the country, I actually would have, with a straight face, say, keep your head down, keep doing the work, and wait it out. I am a little concerned, honestly, that the banner of parent choice has been taken by folks who are driving towards things like banning books um, and reporting teachers for teaching about you know, uh, the fact that there are people with a different sexual orientation. And that worries me a bit, because you know, it's America, right? And so we go from one freaking extreme to the other, and it's, you know, I was actually talking to somebody from another country today, and he, his face drained of color when I talked to him about some of the, about the big tent of school choice that used to exist, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago that doesn't anymore. And now we have this um, kind of uh, assumption of the banner of parent, um, parents demanding what they want in schools. And it isn't necessarily what I would have hoped the message would be. Um, and so that worries me just a bit because there's gonna be a reaction against that as well. And I don't know exactly where all that leads us. I mean, it could be, it could be a reaction that excludes parents in a more definitive way from the conversation, which I think would be tragic, um, but it's also unpredictable in a way that now that I don't think it was unpredictable even maybe six months ago. Mm. That's fascinating. So I, I wanna turn to then pulling the trends that you see, these various tailwinds, headwinds uh, going on, 60% uh, wanting more choice, that's, that, that's encouraging. So we come out, you know, we, we get together again here it used to be in the desert, now it's in San Diego. We get together in five years and, we, and we're looking at what's happened. What's the story of parents and students enrolling in these alternative schooling arrangements uh, that you would tell? What do you think the numbers? I'd love a prediction, uh, if anyone's so bold. I, you know, what, what's the story that we're gonna be telling in three to five years? I'll say um, in three to five years, if we go the right way, right? Like this is my picture. Um, these options will create this kind of self-check to schools that already exist that are failing children because as they see more children back out and families back out, they will have to look at themselves, right? It's like, it's like, oh, wait a minute. If I'm losing more children, then there's no accountability system at my state that makes me accountable to these children, but maybe I should be accountable because there's something I'm doing wrong, right? And if I'm more accountable to myself, like that's a heart thing to realistically point within your systems and say, something we're doing is wrong. And so with that, those schools should, at that point, be creating a different model and partnering with home schools or virtual schools, right? Because they will see that there's children in their school before they bag out and say, it's not working for me. Well, hey, here's this homeschool model that you can partner with. It's worked in the Niles Community School District in Michigan, where they actually have a partnership with their public schools, where when families say, I want to homeschool, they don't just lose those children. Those children actually go to that homeschool and it's partnered with the, with the public school, right? Like, why can't that exist everywhere? Why, why does it have to be we're pulling teeth for children? Our children are not just dollars and seats. They are not just these numbers that we pull out all the hoopla and all the flags when it come down to count day to make sure they're sitting in a seat and we're going to throw pizza parties. But then after the pizza party, it's like, oh, well, we're going to go back to normal. Like, we really don't like you that much. Like, just show up, right? Like, no. Show up on school, count day. <laughs> right. Right. Like, our schools have to be an enjoyable space for children. And our system and our schools are no greater than the education that we give our most marginalized children. My greatest concern about the trend is that if schools do not get their arms around providing choices within their school, schools within their schools, is that our, uh, the, the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots have -nots going, is going to be very wide in five years. Um, there are going to be so many parents that um, leave our schools and create their own or work with KaiPod and connections in ASU Prep Academy um, to design their own experience. We're going to talk about unbundled uh, learning on Wednesday a bit, that 
our schools are going to be void of diversity based on, you know, the fact that there has been almost like a mass exodus in some respect. And so that is my greatest concern. In terms of the trends, um, and again, this is, this is what we're trying to do, is we will have approximately five models to offer families next year that will be full immersion, which is brick and mortar, um, fully online, fully digital, hybrid in the school, um, a hybrid prep experience, we're calling it with digital, where students will have one day off site in a different location. We're, we're piloting that at our West Campus right now with the university. Um, and then a, an ASU prep local experience, which means that those kids may go to a different location as many as three days a, a week. So parents are gonna have those choices and what we ultimately hope to get to, um, <laughs> one of our friends, um, young millennial the other day, is actually our godson, um, they have four children, they're taking them all out of school, and they are going to travel school for the next year. And uh, what they had actually wanted to do was take the kids out for a month, bring them back for a month, take them out for a month. They're really smart people, too. Um, and, uh, and the school said, no, once you take them out, they're out for the year. Mm -hmm. So they went, okay, so we're gone for the year. <laughs> Boom. I think, as, yeah, as a prediction, I think you're going to see in five years, 10 to 20 percent of kids are going to be in alternative pathways. This could be within the school districts. So creative school district leaders who say, I'm going to create homeschool options, virtual school options within my district. So that means 10 million kids could be, could be in pathways that didn't exist before the pandemic. And so, you know, the traditional school works for some kids, and they can continue to do that. But for everyone else, there's going to be creative ways to learn, and that's good for everyone. And at that point, I wonder whether we even call them alternative pathways. Because, I mean, seriously, that's the other thing, is this binary between conventional and alternative. And I, my prediction, maybe not five, I hope five, but 10 for sure, that, that the language won't even really exist um, to, to determine between those two things. So. I love ending on notes like that. Uh, join me in thanking this wonderful panel. And Amara, I've written your prediction down, so I will be back here with you in five years to check it. So thank Somebody you all. 18 will be here. All right. Thank you. Yeah.